my whole life and my whole career, I've been really um, both a clinician and really focused on trying to do the research. Over the past few years in, in my PhD program, I've been really doing both, um, really doing very high level intensive research. Um, and the reason is because we have to publish papers. We have to document. When you're creating something new, when you're creating a new model, no matter how great the results are, you have an obligation to prove it. Um, people come to me all the time and say, hey, have you seen this person's technique? And, you know, they're getting great results. And my first question is, uh, how do I know? How do you know? How do you know? And I don't mean to be, you know, a pain about it, but I'm like, how do you know they're getting really good results? Some people say, well, I've seen it or I use it. Okay. But are you really getting the results that you think you're getting? And maybe you are, but other people are going to ask that question too. And if you don't have data, if you don't have numbers, if you don't have real research behind it, um, nobody's really going to accept that. I mean, we're moving more and more into this evidence-based type practice. And that's important. It doesn't mean that cutting edge, you know, uh, forward leaning or experimental treatments aren't actually the most important. Uh, a lot of the evidence-based stuff doesn't really get great results, as we know. Um, but we do have an obligation to do that. And so the PhD, the reason why I chose the PhD I'm doing in cognitive neuroscience is because one, it's an area of great interest to me, um, looking at neuroscience and how it relates to the brain and behavior and function, but also because it was not only a PhD by dissertation, but by publication, meaning I knew it would force me to write papers. I have to have at least six or seven papers written um, and published on original data where I'm the lead author. And these, these papers have to be published in tier one journals. So they have to be in the top tier journals. They, I have to be the lead author. They have to be mostly original data. Um, and so, you know, all of the evidence and on real outcomes. So I've been over the past three years really focusing on this. And what it's also forced me to do when you're doing a PhD is you really have to look at all the literature that's out there. Really, I've basically looked at with my team of researchers, which I have some of the top neurologists in the world, neuropsychologists as well. And um, we've looked at virtually almost every paper written in regards to primitive reflexes, cognition, and autism. And there aren't that many, which actually is a good thing. Um, many of my research partners who are very well experienced, two of them have over 500 publications, have actually said that they've only seen this a couple of times in their career. And it always meant that there was about to be an area that was going to explode in research. Uh, one of my research partners talked about the late 70s, early 80s. Nobody was writing about attention. And then a couple of people and one person in particular started publishing papers on attention. And then it became an explosion. And now there are probably more papers written on attention than almost any other paper in neuroscience. And they said that looking at what's happening with primitive reflexes and its impact on brain development, that because there's been this increase recently, uh, really focused around my work and my research, it seems like it's one of those focal points in history where it's about to explode. And so, you know, it's Im important. It's an important topic. It's an important subject because it talks about, you know, brain and development and brain function and all of the things that are really the core issues of what's actually happening in the brain. And as I say over and over, uh, that's the one thing that I think our group does that nobody else does. We, need, we can't answer that primary question, what is actually happening in the brain? What is the actual cause? What are we trying to actually do? Um, nobody really knows that, and you know that. So, you know, what I want to do is talk about the importance of research and literature, the research I'm doing, what it actually means, what it means to you, the practitioner that's in there, um, and how you may get involved in research if you want to moving forward, I think that would be great. But I really wanna talk about the relevance of it and what it's telling us and what this new research and what new research coming out is, what the practical application of it is and how you may be able to employ it in your practice now to make a difference. Um, so, you know, it's gonna be an overview, but we're gonna have some really specific, really cool information. By the time I do this at IAFNR, we'll have virtually all of our data collected and I uh, just came, I just published a paper last week, actually, 
um, that just came out on primitive reflexes and autism. This is my second paper. Um, over the next year, we're scheduled to have about 10 papers coming out. We have another really neat paper that is uh, looking at the evolution and uh, history, basically, of brain asymmetry. You know, what is it? Where does it go back to? What's the origins of it? Which is 500 million years ago, by the way, in trilobites. We already can see that there's asymmetry. Um, and this has been well documented. And, you know, what is, what is the underlying thing that really causes brain asymmetry? What are the evolutionary advantages of it? And what happens when we don't have brain asymmetry? This is a really, really important piece that's going to be coming out this year, as well as I have two papers, one on the neuroanatomy of ADHD and one on, on the functional neuroanatomy of uh, autism and looking at Broadman areas and looking at networks and understanding, you know, where the foundation of that is in the body and in the spine, because postural development and movement is really a key to all of this. And so it really comes back to a lot of the spine and posture and movement and primitive reflexes and coordination and balance and the vestibular system and the ocular motor system, you know, where we all live. And, uh, you know, so drawing that, com that comparison and bringing that all together is what I'm going to be doing in my, in my speak, uh, my, my talk this year. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to hearing the other speakers. This is going to be a great year. I hope next year we can get together in person, uh, but I'm really excited about it. So I hope to see you all then. Oh, <laughs>